body of Christ, save me, blood of Christ, inebriate me. As always, these are not just empty words. Welcome to this episode of Pearls of the Interior Life. I think this is episode 124. Thank you for making this time for the Lord. Good to be with you and a part of it. As always, we are looking ahead to this week and we celebrate the uh, solemnity of the Holy Body and Blood of Christ, Corpus Christi, as it's more notably called. Uh, This goes back to the 13th century. A priest, Father Peter, was having serious spiritual doubts about the Eucharist. And one time while celebrating the Mass, the Eucharist began to bleed. The blood poured out and down around the altar. And there's obviously much, much, much more to it than that and actually how that miracle propagates to this day. But yeah, that's the start of this specific feast of Corpus Christi. But it goes goes back much, much longer than that spiritually, mystically, there is uh, from early on in the church, a reverence for the body and blood of Christ. And that's what we're going to look at today. We want to look uh, first at those mystically, just briefly. And then as always, you want to be very practical and turn to a very practical revelation on the body of Christ. So we're going to look to, to two different mystic guides on this. First, Father John Hardin on some of the traditional reflections on body and blood. And then we're going to look to Sister Mary Frances, who we have turned to before, and her reflections on the magnificent Ignatian prayer, uh, the Anima Christi. But let's hop in. So the body and blood of Christ, just some specific reflections, just kind of put us in the mood of things here from Father John Harden. First, on the body of Christ, your father Harden had turned to an ancient Coptic prayer. And this shows how far back we're going deep, deep into the history and the mind of the church and her reflection on Christ in his incarnation and then his sacrifice. Here's this beautiful prayer. Amen, amen, amen. I believe, I believe, I believe and confess to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh that your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, took from Our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Theotokos, Saint Mary. He made it one with his divinity without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. He confessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He gave it up for us upon the holy wood of the cross. Of his own will for us all, truly I believe that this divinity parted not from his humanity for a single moment, not for a twinkling of an eye, given for us for salvation, remission of sins, and eternal life to those who partake of him. I believe, I believe that this is true. Amen. You have to love those prayers of the early church. They're just so raw and unrestrained. Well, here's what Father John Harden has to say about this. Strange as it may sound, when we believe in the real presence, we believe in things twice unseen. We see only what looks like bread and wine, tastes and smells like bread and wine, and yet we are to believe that behind these physical appearances is a man. Faith number one. And we are further to believe that behind the unseen man is God. Faith number two. And Father Harden has pointed out we really have two miraculous presences in the Eucharist because of the hypostatic union, union in Christ, both fully man, fully divine, fully God. So in the Eucharist, we have the man who walked along the shore. In the Eucharist, we have the man who accepted water from the woman at the well to slake his thirst. In the Eucharist, we have the man who sweat drops of blood in the garden, anticipating his suffering and death. And in the Eucharist, we have God. We have God who healed the blind man. We have God who raised Lazarus from the dead. We have God who raised himself from the dead on the third day. And so the holy body of Christ in which we have true man, perfected man and true God. Okay, so where the blood of Christ? Let's again stay with Father John Harden. First, he's going to start with St. Peter from one of his epistles. Here we have, you know that you were redeemed from the vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, not with perishable things as silver and gold, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb, without blemish and without spot. From that, Father Harden continues, Why does Peter identify the blood of the Lamb of God as precious? Well, it is surely precious because it is the blood of no human being. It is the blood of the living God, who took on human nature, capable of shedding his blood. Why was the blood of Christ precious? Because it is the blood of God who took on human nature in order to be able to suffer and to bleed out, let us add, in order to bleed to death. Why precious? Because it is the blood of the living God. So much blood, so much blood throughout history, the, the history within the Bible, the salvation history goes back through the Old Testament, but then that continues through the ribbon of history right up to this very day. So much blood, and it can only be solved with more blood, with a savior who literally bleeds to death, as Father John Harden points out. I, so, so gruesome. Wasn't there some other way? Wasn't there any other way. And it's not unreasonable for us to ask that. The one thing we know for certain is the answer was no. And the reason we know the answer is no is because someone else asked that very question. He asked it in the garden. He asked it just before he then went on to bleed to death for all of us. Christ asked. The answer was no. There is no other way. That cup could not pass. And so we have the precious body and blood of Christ uniquely tied to our salvation. Everything brings us back to that moment. That was the purpose of Christ's incarnation, and it is wrapped in a great deal of mystery. There's certainly a lot that we do understand, a lot that we understand about it through sacred scripture. You could spend a lifetime delving deeper into that. Here we want to look just at one practical aspect of all of this. and and. This comes, we've quoted this before, this is a marvelous reflection. Um, Anima Christi, the soul of Christ. This is a reflection on Ignatius' beautiful, powerful reflection on Christ in his incarnation by Mother Mary Francis. Here's some very practical points that she has to make about the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. First on the body of Christ. And in the Anima Christi, the first three lines are soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. So we start with body of Christ, save us. And Mother Mary Frances, she makes the point that there's more to it than the obvious. The obvious, and with very good reason, is to go directly to the Eucharist. And certainly so, the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith, Christ fully present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is that source of our salvation, how we receive Christ into us so he can continue that regenerative work in us. Absolutely. But it's easy to just stop there and miss much more of the big picture. And she goes back to the point that Christ became man and that Christ, his body wasn't just kind of some worldly little vessel to get around in. Like he could have been anything. If he, if he came around today, he could have been a robot. No, that was always the plan. And that reveals something to us about our body here. Our bodies are so noble. The infamous carnal sinners of history are not those who love their bodies too much, but those who love their bodies too little. Do we likewise recognize the horrors we create in life when we do not allow the body to act with the soul, to be served by the soul, and in turn to serve the soul, the body must be taught that the soul is its animating principle. When the body has desires that go beyond what the soul, the animating principle of the body, knows to be rightful boundaries, it must be admonished by the soul, by the mind. The soul says to the body, do not pass this boundary. And the body replies, I will. The body wishes to, and often enough, does disobey the incorporeal faculties. But then she points out, it is only in Christ, the perfect man, the firstborn of all creation, that we see the perfect functioning of the body. And so it is his body that will save us, that will show us how to be whole. And obviously, this isn't simple. We face this again and again. We know what we should do. We don't do it. We have the box of donuts instead of the one donut. And far worse than that, of course. 
But here's the very practical advice. So what do we do? We cannot use ourselves as a psychological punching bag. You know, we don't just beat ourselves up. Okay, I overindulged again. No, we cannot order ourselves about with a get in line there, buddy. Rather, we need humbly to pray, body of Christ, save me. I shall never save myself. This beautiful body of mine, this creation of God, can become the enemy of salvation just as my incorporeal faculties can. But the body of Christ can save me. Ought this not be the favorite prayer in times of temptation, of languor, of frustration, of sensual attraction, of sloth? Body of Christ, save me. And the point here is, what gives anything that we do meaning when it has context? If we just do something totally out of the blue, we have no idea why we're doing it. Take wedding vows. You could give any two actors the words to say. They could just go ahead and say them. How much different is it when it is two young people that have discerned marriage? They, In life, they've discerned that's their vocation. Lord, this is what I am here for. I am here for family life. I know that there is someone that you desire for me. And then they meet and they court and they spend that time together. They talk and they wrestle with all the different things on their mind and their heart and they decide to go ahead and they prepare and they come to that day. How much more then is there behind those words that they say? And that's how it is with prayer. I, yeah, if you just th- throw in the heathen moment, oh, body of Christ, do something for me. Well, God can always work through anything, but how much more powerfully if we spend time in the Gospels reflecting on the life of Christ, reflecting on that beautiful combination that he had of body and soul, always perfectly present, very happy to go and spend time celebrating at weddings and at feasts, very happy to spend time toiling at work as a carpenter, then very happy to pour himself out as a libation teaching and healing and feeding the multitudes and eventually giving his life on the cross. When we spend time deep in meditation on these realities of Christ and that perfect union of his body and his soul, and then when we're in those moments of temptation and we call out, body of Christ, save me, wow, now there is a newfound power there because we are calling out in relationship someone who who we know in a very deep way. Body of Christ, save me. Okay, now how about blood of Christ? Blood of Christ, inebriate me. The first thing Mother Mary points out is, you know, sadly how our culture is just so debauched, the meaning of inebriation, we just think right away, of course, alcohol and bad memories from New Year's Eve and whatever else it might be be and how as always the enemy comes in and takes something that's so good and so beautiful and he twists it he deforms it into something low and dehumanizing mother mary points out with inebriation the spirit it is different here are the true exhilaration and enlivenment that lift us above and beyond the ordinary this type of inebriation gives us superhuman ability. This is spiritual inebriation that enlivens us, that motivates us, that carries us forth. She it makes note that this is the inebriation that led martyrs to go happily, happily into their martyrdom, happily into the Colosseum and face the, the death from wild beasts. And St. Stephen was able to pray for his persecutors as they martyred him. This is that inebriation that takes us way beyond our ordinary human limitations. This is the inebriation of the Holy Spirit. How does this play out in practicality? Well, you and I may not be called to true martyrdom, although with the way the world's going, who's to say? But we have our daily encounters, and here's what Mother Mary has to say about this. And when we go singing, not necessarily emotionally, but with the great inebriation of the will, which functions with or without the support factor of the motions into daily little dyings. It is again the effect of the blood of Christ in all of the hidden humdrum martyrdoms that are part of real Christian daily living. One must be inebriated to agree to them singing 
in all the little sacrifices of each day when God cheerfully invites us, come and die, we can respond with a joy more profound than a merely human one. One needs only to have an inebriated heart able to transcend its natural limitations and to follow a difficult path with unflinching feet. Yes, I will die. We die to our own preferences. We die to the tart response that nature quickly frames when we are offended. We die to the caustic reply that pride proposes. We die to the sensual urges that often surprise us with their insistence. One goes singing into all these invitations to the little deaths of every day only when one is inebriated with the blood of Christ. And so she really just rings this home. You know, when we're hitting those struggles in life that just seem that they're beyond us, because they are because we have three enemies against us not only our own fallen nature but the world and satan and his minions it is too much for us alone but nothing nothing is beyond the power of christ and so she says she encourages why not turn to what is so accessible to us in the merits of the precious blood of christ and become inebriated with it so that we might have a strength that can discover no, that is not too much. I can do it. I can lift the weight of this cross. I can sustain this activity. I can suffer this oppression. I am inebriated. I have a strength beyond the ordinary. And all because I am possessed of the inebriating power that arises out of union with Christ. And so we meditate on these. We meditate on Christ's body. We meditate on his blood poured out in his crucifixion so that they become so real to us. So when our own bodies seem to be fighting us, we say, body of Christ, save me. Then when all of the pressures and demands of the world are too much, blood of Christ, inebriate me. Why did Christ become man? Why did he spill out his blood for us? There's endless reasons. We can, again, spend a lifetime reflecting on them, but not the least of which, not the least of which, is to show the lengths that he will go to to share in our life and be there when we but call on him. So with that, wishing you a tremendous feast of Corpus Christi. And I look forward to being with you again.